On behalf of Namitha Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Team Book Arts, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World. Our magazine partner for this series is the week, Journalism with a Human Touch. Even as we've completed over 110 episodes with uh, 3.4 million views, it is our endeavor to replay some of our very best sessions from JLF's Brave New World in this series, Redux. Our first session today is Margaret Atwood, The Science of Storytelling in Conversation with Megha Majumdar. Margaret Atwood is one of the greatest writers of our time as she speaks of the power of language, the science of storytelling, and the challenges of the present. Margaret Atwood, whose work has been published in more than 45 countries, is the author of over 50 books of fiction, poetry, critical essays, and graphic novels. Her latest work, The Testaments, is a co-winner of the 2019 Booker Prize. It is the long-awaited sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, now an award-winning TV series. Her other works of fiction include Cat's Eye, finalist for the 1989 Booker Prize, Elias Grace, which won the Giller Prize in Canada, and the Premio Mondello in Italy, The Blind Assassin, winner of the 2000 Booker Prize, the Mad Adam Trilogy, and Hackseed. Megha Majumdar was born and raised in Kolkata, India. She moved to the United States to attend college at Harvard University, followed by graduate school in social anthropology at John Hopkins. She works as an editor at Catapult. A Burning is her first book, and it's already a huge bestseller. All our sessions are available, as you know, on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest GLF. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest GLF. Ladies and gentlemen, Margaret Atwood, the science of storytelling in conversation with Megha Majumdar. Hi. I'm delighted to chat with icon Margaret Atwood. Um, and we're going to chat for 35 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes in which we'll take questions from the audience. Um, first of all, big thanks to Namita, Shonjoy, and everyone at JLF for organizing this virtual edition. And we were just talking a few minutes ago, Margaret, about how you went to the Jaipur Literature Festival a few years ago. What was that like? It was amazing. It was, uh, first of all, it, it's free, you know, unlike a lot of things. So it's hugely well attended. And um, it, is a, it is an open free speech space. Uh, so people just pile into it. And it has a huge variety of speakers. And then it has, of course, the added uh, excitement of being in Rajasthan. So we had, we, had, we had elephants. You know, you don't get elephants at every literary festival. That's true. Um... You have written speculative dystopian fiction that feels chillingly real. So I want to start with a couple questions about your imagination of the future. Um, and I think a question that is on everybody's minds right now is when the pandemic passes, what will we do differently as a society? Well, people talk about returning to normal, but time only flows one way. So it will be a, a different kind of normal, and I expect it will be a more thoughtful normal. There's a, a lot of uh, writing and talk right now about uh, the fact that we're all in this together. You know, we are unified around the world in a way that uh, once was just not true. Uh, and we are also uh, part of nature. So nature isn't something over there. It's something we live within. And usually we think, you know, lions and tigers and bears over there, us over here. But nature is much more than things we can see, as we have just discovered. So we're probably going to live more thoughtfully in relation to nature and go back to earlier religious traditions, which taught exactly that. Uh, so we are going to have more respect for the natural world and we're going to be thinking more about how to uh, repair the damage 
we have done while also benefiting people who live in uh, those regions. And if you want to see some of that kind of thing, you can go to Project Drawdown, which is a website that talks about earth repairing strategies that also make life better for people and will have the net effect of drawing carbon down out of the atmosphere. Mm. So that's one of the things we're, we'll be doing. Another thing we'll be doing is thinking about how we've been living. And um, we've been doing a lot of things remotely um, now. In fact, we've been doing everything remotely. Uh, so, so we're not going to continue to do everything remotely, but I think we will do remotely more things than we did before because we will be able to save time, money, distance, and, and energy emissions that way. Among all of the changes that we're talking about that have taken place during this pandemic, one kind of frightening strain that has shown itself is this strain of anti-scientific thinking. Um, and I was wondering, as somebody who really... Oh, you froze. In your writing, um, what do you think is the role of storytellers in pushing back against anti-scientific thinking? Well, let's let's just talk about what science is and isn't. Uh, it's it's a way of describing the world, uh, which is based on we hope fact, but it is constantly correcting itself. Science is constantly finding that some of the things it thought were facts actually aren't. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing process. And the reason people, some people don't like it is that they want certainty. And they want to know, is this true or is it not true? Um, so we're finding out isn't a good answer for them. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to, to viruses and how they spread, science really pretty, it, it knows. It knows how this virus gets into your cells. It knows how the virus takes over your cells and turns them into virus factories, and then how it explodes the cell from within. So you can that that can be that can be seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so so the people who don't want to believe in any of that uh, are really saying we want to go on with life the way we were living it before. And that would be all very well for them. It's their choice. But unfortunately, it also means that they have elected to spread it to other people. So I would say my right to do what I want ends at the part where it threatens your life. Uh, storytellers probably are not who exactly we're going to turn to right now unless they're writing about um, what it's like uh, being in the situation and what happens to people who elect not to believe uh, what scientists are clearly telling them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be cautionary tales and uh, life in a crisis. Uh, and, and in that sense, everyone is their own storyteller. So we all know what we are experiencing. I expect a lot of people are writing journals. Those will be very interesting to look back on, on later. Do so you I think, think you know sto what storytellers can do is communicate in fairly clear language. You know, take take out the technicalities, make it short. Uh, my short form about politicians who are who have chosen not to believe what scientists have told them is they lied you died. That's four words. Do you think writing about dystopias can be a way of bringing about change? Well, dystopian uh, fiction, which describe man-made unpleasant societies, and, and this virus is not man-made. Uh, it's had dystopian effects, but it wasn't planned. Nobody said, let's have a pandemic. Hooray. Um, so dystopian societies are like blueprints of a house you haven't built yet. So people read them and what the reader is really being asked to think is, is this the house you want to live in? 
And if the answer is no, take a different road, design a different house, uh, decide that you will live in that better house rather than this dystopian house that has been described to you. So unfortunately, we're not very good at building heaven. It has been tried. <laughs> But we're you quite have... good. They quite we're quite good at building hell, and uh, most yeah. most dystopian details are drawn from from history. You know, they've already been done. Exactly, and this isn't the first time that you're experiencing quarantine. Um, you have experienced quarantine before as a child. Yes. Well, people who are as old as I am. Uh, grew up at a time when a lot of these vaccines were not available. So quarantine was, was a pretty frequent uh, thing to see. You would see a great big yellow or red sign on somebody's house saying quarantine, and nobody could go in and nobody could come out, and people delivered things to the front door, as we are doing now. And uh, people died. In fact, a lot of children died of these diseases like diphtheria and polio, uh, for which there were not yet any vaccines. So then generations came along that did get vaccinated, and they weren't used to occasions like this. So young people are thinking, oh, nothing like this has ever happened before. But in fact, it was, it was regular before these diseases were brought under control. Small, smallpox was a huge killer uh, before vaccination became, became widespread and it's enormously infectious and almost always fatal. So people died in droves. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm kind of used to it. And, <laughs> and now we're gonna have a whole generation of young people who've had this experience and if it happens again, they will know much better what to do. Hmm. You mentioned how lots of people are keeping journals now, and that's probably a valuable thing to do. And you've also written about all of the other things you are doing, from um, knitting to making fire starters. Uh, what advice do you have for people looking for creative outlets through this? Okay, keeping a journal will, number one, make you feel less anxious, and number two, it'll be really interesting to read later. Um, but I, I think the main thing is to take the focus off yourself and either onto an activity that's taking up your energy or to helping other people or to an activity that's helping other people. Um, so one must keep saying, this isn't just about me. You know, there, and if you're in a house, if you've got food, uh, if you're not ill, you're better off than a huge number of other people. So, uh, so that's comforting to think. And it's also comforting to think that in that case, you have agency um, to help other people. So pick something um, that you can do. Don't try to save all the world at once. That's not possible, but pick one thing that you can do and then just, just do it. I think it's also useful to have a, a schedule so that you are uh, not just in your pajamas all day uh, <laughs> on the sofa and worrying, watching the news and, and um, you know, eating potato chips. I'm good. That's it's counterproductive. You've been doing some really big things during this time, like you've been part of a really valuable initiative called Canada Performs. Um, can you tell us about that and perhaps any lessons for those in India who might be looking for ways to support the arts like JLF is doing? Yeah, so Canada Performs is an initiative by the National Arts Center in Ottawa. And it began as a way of giving uh, live performance artists a platform because of course they they couldn't do live performances anymore. So they were doing musicians and actors and uh, singers. And um, I then said, well, you know, a lot of a lot of writers, especially writers who are having spring books, they're supposed to be having book launches because so they can't have live. Uh, they're performers too, because normally they would be going around giving live performances of their work. So we got them included in, and uh, Facebook very kindly kicked some money into uh, that program to allow the 
the authors, the spring list authors to have a platform. And uh, I kicked it off with Adrian Clarkson, who is our formal, former governor general and an old pal of mine. And we did a, an online show in which we actually didn't have any of the books and we hadn't read many of the books. So all we could do was talk about the books that we had looked at online that we thought we might like to read. <laughs> so we talked about those and why we might like to read them. And we put that list up. And that's how we kicked off that uh, Authors Live segment of Canada Performs. Um, and do you think you are, uh, you have any advice to offer for those in India who would like to do something similar? Well, the, the internet is yours. <laughs> you know, here we are <laughs> talking about Zoom. Uh, maybe JLF could do a spring book list um, author's segment to help people who can't do book launches in the ordinary way to launch their books online. And mm -hmm. of course, authors who have social media accounts can, can for instance, um, tweet um, books such as this one, which is yours. <laughs> Congratulations. You're so kind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. Yes, a, a shocking tale. I was I was um, uh, very interested in it, and um, I think it has some cautionary lessons uh, for us. And it does involve a social media mishap, uh, which gets the person who does it in, in a lot of trouble. Yeah, a lot. Now, don't tell me you based this on a true thing. <laughs> I can't believe you read my book. Um... This is why, so why gracious would, of you. Thank you. <laughs> why, why would I not read your book? It has such a beautiful orange cover. <laughs> the other book that I I read is this one. And um, I'm thinking of doing a little virtual travel uh, list of, of books that take, take you to places that you can't go right now. And this is about the Jaipur Literary Festival. It's called Jaipur Journals. And it's by Namita Gokali, who has been very instrumental in, in uh, putting that together. So you can travel to the festival by reading this book. And the third one that I'll mention that a lot of people would be interested in is, is uh, Famous Bookshops of the World. And he, he has gone and visited them all. So Bookshops, A Reader's History, uh, and it's Jorge Carrion. This is the English translation, but um, we can't travel right now, but we can travel in books. Yeah, that looks like a beautiful book. Um, you've said that you are so interested in how technology influences storytelling. Um, what do you think are the possibilities of this Zoom and video calling age? Are you seeing people use them in fun ways? Yes, we have a, a project in Canada right now, which is um, a way of putting on a play via Zoom. Now it has to be particular kinds of plays. I shouldn't just say Zoom, I should say multi-platform uh, online uh, possibilities. So this particular play has got six actors in it and it's very appropriate because it's the uh, six uh, men who were left behind during the Scott Antarctic expedition and found that they, they were supposed to be collecting rock specimens or something and their pickup boat didn't arrive. So they had to get through the Antarctic winter um, with really no support. And they did, none of them died. And the play really describes what they went through. So, so we think we're in lockdown. They were really in lockdown. They were in an ice house they had made and they were eating nothing but, but seals and penguins, which gave them all diarrhea inside their ice house, you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> how awful that was. But a play like that is, is really perfect for presenting online because you can show the, the six actors all in their own houses um, and you can have them all online at once. So, so plays with small numbers of characters and no sword fighting scenes uh, be perfect <laughs> for presenting online. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I think people are going to start writing for for the medium, you know, a new medium arrives, people start playing with it and getting creative with it and uh, seeing what they can do with it. 
It's Speaking like sonnet, sonnet, yeah, sonnet, a limited form. It has rules. Uh, but within that form, you can become uh, very inventive. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of writing, I know many, many people are so curious to hear, what does the seed of a book look like in your mind? How do you imagine and plot out your books? All right, it's, it's different. Uh, first of all, I never went to creative writing school. I'm, I'm too old, there weren't any. Uh, I think there was only one, it was in Iowa, and I'd, I'd actually never heard of it at that time. <laughs> Um, so I, I never was told anything about, about how to write. Uh, so it could be a conversation, it could be a scene, it could be an image, it could be um, just, just a, 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 little, a little visual item that starts off a book. And sometimes I will, I will start with that and, and that thing will move quite far back into the book. So I may have written it first, but it will move along and become something that happens later. And sometimes it will be a physical object that, that transforms while I'm writing the book into, into something else, a different physical object. And sometimes it will just disappear. It may have been the seed, <laughs> but by a lot, you... like a lot, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to ask, what kind of objects do you mean? Well, um, in one of them, it was a, it was a ceramic bowl, um, and it turned into a vase full of somebody's ashes, <laughs> like wow. that, like yeah. that. That makes sense. And you've written across so many genres. You've written fiction, nonfiction, um, poetry, children's books. I'm so curious to hear if there are storytelling rules that you follow across genres. All right, I think there's one main rule and that is you have to get the reader interested in what you're writing. <laughs> so when I work with other people's uh, writing, which I do a little bit from time to time, I only work, if it's a novel, I only work with the first five pages because reality is, close your eyes, close your eyes, close. <laughs> okay, you're walking into a bookstore. There's your book. It's in the bookstore. You're a reader. You've never heard of this writer, but it has an attractive orange cover and a zippy title. Those are important. <laughs> Uh, so it has an attractive orange cover and a, and a zippy title, and you, the reader, you pick it up. What's the first thing you do? If Read you're like most line. people, no. If you're like most people, you might look at the author's photo, <laughs> but you're more likely to look at, you'll probably look at both these things. You look at the inside front flap. And the inside front flap will have a brief description of the book, which you, the author, will have had to rewrite because somebody at the company will have written it and sent it to you. And usually that person is an intern. So this is one of the most important things if you want somebody to read your book. So you, you, you will have rewritten it, you will have corrected the characters' names, you will have taken off the part at the end where it blows the plot. Uh, and that's the intro. So. So you read that, and then if you're sufficiently interested, you read the first page. All right, if the first page doesn't hook you, you're not going to turn to page two. So five pages, if you've, if you've gone five pages, you'll probably buy the book. Okay, if you're an editor or an agent, if, if you can get through the first five pages and you're sufficiently interested, you'll read 25. If the 25 sufficiently interested, you'll read 50. And then the book is a serious possibility. But you know this because you work with a publishing company. <laughs> yes. I do. So yes. the first five pages, give me a reason. It's, it's, the, it's the ancient mariner uh, thing. The ancient mariner stops the wedding guest. There's three wedding guests, but he only stops one. So that's his reader, as it were. 
He has something to tell that reader that the reader needs to hear. The reader says initially, don't bother me, I've got other things to do. But the ancient mariner uh, is sufficiently compelling that he, he hypnotizes the wedding guest into listening to him. Well, that's mm -hmm. what you basically have to do. You have to go, you need to hear this. You need to hear this. And you need to hear either because um, it's got a message just for you, because this is something new that you've never read before, because it's a compelling story, because the character interests you and you want to know what happens to them, uh, all of those reasons. But, but, but hook me in in the first five pages. You need to do that as a writer. I love that you brought up the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And I think a lot of us um, who are watching from India will remember that we had to study that poem in school. <laughs> um, there, was, there, there was a reason why you had to do it because you were preparing to be a writer and it's about storytelling. <laughs> mm -hmm. All makes sense now. Um, I think we're going to open it up to audience questions. We have a lot of them pouring in. Here's one from Rijula. How has your revision process changed over the years? Um, it, uh, computers were invented just for me because before uh, they were here with us, you actually cut and pasted. So you used scissors <laughs> and glue. So I used to cut out my manuscripts and paste them, uh, move things around. And now you can do that on the screen, but that's why it's called cut and paste because people use, use, used to actually cut and paste. So revision means revision. You're, you're seeing it again. You have to come to your manuscript as if you're the reader, not as if you're the writer. And if you're the reader, you don't yet know what happens. A writer can never read their own book, really. Uh, but be, because you already know what happens, you, you've peaked. Um, but during revision, you have to pretend, I have never seen this page before. And therefore, what is wrong with it? And I still work uh, on paper with them, with the pencil, when I'm doing the final revisions. Because you see things better that way. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And I still see pictures of people revising in that way, laying out pages on the ground. Um, here's a question from Vrinda and Nidhi who ask, what was the starting point for Handmaid's Tale? Okay, the starting point for Handmaid's Tale uh, was, was threefold. Number one, um, my study of 17th century Puritan theocracy in New England one of the foundational stones of America. Uh, number two, my interest in sci-fi sci and speculative fiction as a teenage person, actually quite a young teenage person, I read a lot of it. And I'd always wanted to write a book like that, but uh, didn't feel I was quite ready until The Handmaid's Tale. And number three, the rise of the religious right in the 1980s in the United States. And uh, my um, failure to believe people who said it can't happen here. So anything can happen anywhere given the circumstances. We're, we're, never, we're never exempt. There isn't something that says this will never happen where you are. Uh, so after that, then, then of course, my experience during uh, the 20th century, um, growing up in the Second World War, I've always been interested in dictatorships and how they get a hold, how they maintain themselves and how they fall apart and what hooks people into them. You know, why people, why some people think, hey, this might be a good idea. Uh, so one of the rules of dictatorships is once they're in, they're kind of hard to get rid of. <laughs> So, so don't, don't do it if you have a choice. All rings so true right now. Um, alas, alas, it does. Sarah asks, what kinds of stories are you looking forward to reading that are coming out of this pandemic? Hmm. Uh, 
that is going to depend on the inventiveness and skill of the people who write them. Um, so we, we know a lot about behavior during pandemics because uh, pandemics have been with us since recorded history. They're, they're very old things. Uh, the difference between uh, old ones and ours is that, is that we know what is causing this one. And imagine being in an ancient one where people just didn't know. They, they thought, uh, well, it's because of Oedipus. The gods are angry. Apollo, is, Apollo god of mice, is uh, shooting invisible arrows at us. Uh, or some version of that. We've done something bad. Um, so maybe we have done something bad, but that's not the immediate cause of getting an infection from a virus. Anyway, we know more about it. Uh, I think it's really going to depend on, all right, from his point of view, is the writer going to, to write their book? How are they going to get us interested? It's the first five pages story. Are we going to say, oh, this is another pandemic novel? No, not interested. Read enough of those. Tell me something new. Mm. And here's another craft related question. Kostav asks, how do you plan an ending? Does it change as the story evolves or do you have a fixed ending in mind that you work toward? I, I never really have, um, a let, let me put it this way. I, I usually think I'm, I know what the ending is going to be and I'm usually wrong. So some people have their, their entire book all planned out. And if you're writing a murder mystery, you have to do that. Um, you have to know from the beginning who done it um, because you have to sprinkle the fake clues and the um, wrong pathways uh, throughout the book. It's a game between you and the reader. Uh, will they guess? Will they guess before you tell them? Will, will, will they know before Hercule Poirot assembles everybody in the drawing room? <laughs> uh, but, but that's not the kind of book I write, unfortunately. I, I like reading them, but I, I can't write them. So yeah. I, I, I'm more like a mud pie maker. So I start out with some mud. I make a, a mud pie. It's not a very good one. I, I squash the mud up again and, and uh, rearrange it. And, and that goes on throughout the writing of the book. So unless I'm surprising myself as I go, I, I, I might lose interest. Yeah. So part of writing a book for me is, to, is describing, um, wow. and it's discovering um, what's going on. Why am I writing this? <laughs> Why am I telling you the story? <laughs> yeah, that, that might be related like that. to another a question that Simranjit asks, um, which is that so many people are having trouble writing right now. What's your personal mm -hmm. remedy for writer's block? Are they, are they distracted because they're anxious or are they, are they afraid of the page? Hmm. Okay, let's say afraid of the page. So usually when people are afraid of the page, they're afraid of some person in their life or persons unknown reading their book and not liking it. That's probably what they're afraid of. So um, here's the page. It's got nothing on it. And nobody's watching you until you decide to show people what you've written on that page. It's a secret between you and the page. So if you write on that page and don't like what you've written, the waste paper basket is your friend. You can just throw, crumple it up and throw it away and start again. So just plunge in, nobody's watching. It's a lot like practicing the piano in a soundproof room. You're going to make mistakes, but nobody's hearing them. So don't be embarrassed or shy, just go for it and you will surprise yourself. Uh, you will surprise yourself at what you write. Remember, nobody sees it until you say so. We hope. That's very encouraging. <laughs> and we hope nobody's gonna sneak in and read your bad <laughs> manuscript before you've revised it. Um, here's a somewhat different question about government. Um, 
Iram asks, do you think scientific management will work better than political management? I guess it's a question about, do you see new styles of governance emerging from this? Um, oh boy, what a question. Um, I, don't, I don't think we'd necessarily be better off in, this, in the hands of a governing body composed of scientists. Um, I think we'd be better off in the hands of a governing body composed of people who listen to scientists. Uh, but scientists are, they have a, they have a specialist focus, you know, if you want to know about viruses, you go to somebody whose specialty is viruses. They've done nothing all their life but study viruses. Uh, but they may not be terribly aware of something like a housing crisis. You know, so gov government has to be, has to have a broad range of interests because uh, people live in so many dimensions. So. Uh, what you eat, where you live, your healthcare system, uh, who's paying for it? Uh, what about international trade and business? Uh, what about our treatment of the planet? So, so politicians are not specialists, but they should listen to specialists. Mm -hmm. They themselves and have to have to be connected with people, how people really live, what their needs actually are. Um, if they're good politicians, if they're bad politicians, they don't care about that. They just rearrange things so, so that, that them and their friends make lots of money. And that's the kind of politician you don't want to have. Speaking of bad politicians, here's a question from Ekta who asks, do you think this pandemic is going to make it easier for governments to have greater surveillance and control over people? They're trying their best. And quite often when these kinds of uh, controls go in, it's hard to get rid of them. So income tax came in in World War I as a temporary measure. <laughs> um, I did not know that. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> yes, there were taxes before on all kinds of things. Once upon a time, there, there was a tax on beards. Uh, there was a tax on bachelors. There was a tax on windows. You can, you can rearrange people's behavior by the kinds of taxes you put on things. But a tax on income, that was an early 20th century so-called temporary measure. But it was so agreeable to the politicians uh, that you can say that they kept it on. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Sumit going back to craft. How do you craft your characters? Do you take someone from real life and then mold them? Or are they complete figments of your imagination? Well, there's no, there's no such thing as a complete figment of your imagination because we, we learn about people from other people and whether those are people in real life or whether they're people in books or whether they're people in movies, uh, they're all people. And even if the novel is about rabbits, it's still about people because we don't have a choice about that. So hobbits are people. <laughs> Darth Vader as a person. Um, yeah, so it's, it's all people and, and we gather our ideas um, about people from a large thing called the people sphere. And that would be fictional people, um, your family, other people you've known, stuff you've read in newspapers um, about people. So everywhere, but I do try not to um, be too individual about them. So unless I know that that there are several instance of, instances of a kind of behavior. Um, I don't put a, a specific unique thing in. And I also look up in the phone book to make sure that a person with that name doesn't actually exist in that place. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pushpanjana has a question about memoir writing. Um, she asks, do you think this pandemic will lead people to start memoir writing? And perhaps I'll, perhaps I'll rephrase that a tiny bit to ask what advice you would have for people who are seeking to write personal essays, personal stories at this time. Well, write them by all means. Mem memoir writing has been a, a thing for some years. Um, and it, it gives me a big chuckle when I find a a book of memoirs by somebody who's 30, I think, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> you're not very old. But of course, when you're 30, you think you are really, really old. 
I certainly thought that, oh my goodness, I'm, you know, it's the end <laughs> of the world. I'm, oh, 30. <laughs> it's all over. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, uh, it's the same rule. Tell me something interesting. So have you ever been stuck on a bus beside somebody who's got all their pictures of their trip to Paris? Here's me in front of the Eiffel Tower. Here's me along the Seine. Here's me with my own. Uncle Charlie, whom you don't know and you never will know, but I'm showing you this picture of him and not telling you anything interesting about him. Uh, so it's the same as any story. Memoirs are stories too. Um, tell me, tell me something that isn't about what you did on Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. You you can do that if you if you can make it interesting enough. An English country woman's diary. Uh, of ordinary life during the Tudors. You know, we were, we're very happy to have those accounts now, but, but at the time they were um, just daily life, stuff that everybody knew. Uh, we're interested in reading it now because we don't know those things. Well, what did you eat when you got up in the morning? Um, yeah, so it's like that, the story we want to we want to hear because it's interesting or because it's things we want to know and don't know. I think we will take one more question and then wrap up. Um, and perhaps this is a good one to end on. It's from Sanskriti, who asks about womanhood. I think you capture womanhood in its truest, rawest form. How do you write about women so powerfully? So women are people. <laughs> Big shock. <laughs> They're, <laughs> women are human beings. They're part of the people sphere. Uh, and in that people sphere are all kinds of people. And when people say women as if they were sort of undifferentiated and they're all the same, the answer to that is no, no more than, than other people, such as men. Um, so, so they have certain things in common, but then a lot, a lot, a lot of, of differences. So how old is the woman? Woman, where does she live? Uh, how tall is she? Uh, and is that short or tall in her society? I, I, I hate to break this to you, but once upon a time I was the average size. Now it appears I'm quite short. <laughs> Other people got taller. I don't know how that happened. Um, so uh, when did she grow up? How rich was her family? Uh, what sort of country does she live in? What, what kind of city? Or does she live in a city? Does she live in the country somewhere? How does that make life different for her? Is she um, struggling? What are her opportunities? Does she have children? Are the children numerous? Are they well? Are they sick? Are there problems with them? You know, all of these things are, um, are, are going to be different depending when and where, when, and um, you know, who this, this individual person is. So uh, I do write about women quite a bit. I also write about, about other people such as men. Um, and I, I think, again, it's a, it's a matter of character, and all of these things feed into character. You're always going to know more about your character than you put on the page. You need to know what they have for breakfast. You need to know what's in their bureau drawers, if they have a bureau. Um, do they have a job? Um, if not, how are they maintained on this planet? Who's paying for their food? Uh, all of these things are, are really important. And, and what is the person's expectation of, of what she should be doing in life? What have other people told her about that? How does she understand her position? Uh, is that limiting? Is it not limiting? Is it a surprise when she, when she does something different? Yeah. I'm told we can sneak in one more question. So um, this being Earth Day, perhaps we'll go with a question about nature and climate change from Catherine, who asks, um, going forward, do you think nature will become a more important part of government policy? Uh, it has to be so for a very simple reason. If the oceans die, so will we, because it is from the oceans 
that 60 to 80 percent of the oxygen oxygen that we breathe comes and the rest of it comes from plant life on land so once upon a time the earth's atmosphere was not an oxygen atmosphere it was a methane atmosphere and the life forms that we have now uh, depend on oxygen because 1.9 billion years ago uh, marine algaes made oxygen so we have to deal with this we have to regenerate the oceans or we will stop breathing first of all we'll get very stupid we will we will have the mentality of somebody who's climbed everest without an oxygen tank your brain gets oxygen starved and um and and then of course our high functioning technology will cease to function because we won't be able to run it <laughs> which button what's a button um and and that it will be game over for human beings although probably not for uh, insects and certainly not for trees so that's yeah. why it will have to be and canada has just taken a, a big step in that direction by kicking a lot of stimulus money into uh regenerating parts of nature that have uh, been impacted by toxic uh, oil drilling hmm. well on that note thank you so much margaret thank you namita kritika and their colleagues at jlf and teamwork um, i'm so happy we got to chat today thank you so much thank margaret. you it was lovely thank you thank, thank you. you so much margaret that would make her mazumdar it was absolutely an honor to have you both margaret thank you so much for coming to the main festival when you did and yes, everything has changed. The world will change post-COVID, perhaps for the better. We don't know. But we look forward to welcoming you back at some point, either to an online show or the festival. Uh, from all of us at the Jaipur Literature Festival, uh, thank you truly, uh, both of you, for everything. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and will log back on at 8.30 p.m. for our next session, Otto Lenghi's Lockdown Kitchen. Yotam Ottolenghi in conversation with Ravindra Bhogal. See you at 8.30.